Young people, I challenge you, take what you've learned, study God's word, and go and talk to your friends in, in school, in, in the workplace, on the internet, on Facebook, whatever, and very lovingly show them from God's word. Just take one scripture and say, have you ever read this? That's all it takes a lot of times. And help be the yeast in their lives. Plant the seed in their heart that may bear fruit. And I want to challenge our viewers, not only in, this, in the internet and in the audience also, to, to challenge your friends. To challenge yourself. We may have some viewers tonight who are members of denomination and don't even know it. Compare your denomination with the church of the New Testament. Ask questions and receive and expect only Bible answers. If we can help you in any way, please contract, contact the church here at Spring and, and we will help you find the truth. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Apostle Paul says, Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Brethren, that is one of the great sins of denominationalism. Denominations take that glory that, Christ, that God intended for the Christ and his body and take it away. Take away, try to bypass that glory. Take the shine off the stone, so to speak. They try to bypass the divine purpose that God had for the church. What is that purpose? Brethren, more as I preach the gospel, more as I study the gospel, study the word of God, I realize that that purpose is to save us from the wrath to come. That's what salvation is. Salvation is to make me feel better, not to make me live a happy life, and that's part, that is the sum of it, the effect of it. But salvation is to save us from the wrath of the Lamb of God when he comes again. Because brethren, the... the Church is the only ark of safety that we will have when the Lamb comes again. Denominations come along and they want to change that ark into a man-made organization. They are abominations in the sight of God and a stench into his nostrils. Brethren, to be entirely negative this afternoon, let me say that we live in a decaying world. A world headed for judgment, divine judgment. And as I mentioned, nothing in this world, I believe I mentioned this last night as well, nothing in this world will last for eternity. Nothing. Not our homes, not our possessions, not our associations, not our friendships, not our monies. Nothing will last for eternity except the church that Jesus built. You know, that's no more apparent than in a denominational world today as you look at it. In the Western world, we see the old denominations, the Baptists, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, crumbling, devolving, twisting, and contorting themselves to become relevant to a, a public that is fickle, and not relevant to the all-seeing eye. God Almighty. Their bureaucracies, their organizations are constantly seeking ways that they can bring money in because you see they have this big organization they have to keep up. They have this grand ecclesiastical structure and they have to pay the utility bills too, you know, on that structure. I remember a little place I preached at North Texas. It was a Methodist church there, pretty building. Been there for years. In fact, it was a historic marker by it, you know. One year, they, they had an organ in there, and 
and they had to keep the temperature just right year round. Not too hot, not too cold. But one year the utility bill was so big and their numbers had gone so down so low they had to shake every bush in town to try to find a, a, a Methodist to pay for that utility bill. Thank God we don't have to do that. Thank God that our hearts are that instrument of making melody to God. Praising God. Almost 200 years ago, our spiritual forefathers forsook all those creeds and disciplines and catechisms and confessions that was, was that, of that ungodly mess that was 19th century denominationalism for the freshness, simplicity of New Testament Christianity. Brethren, these were brave men, women, and children who came out of the darkness into the light of God's revealed will. Brother Brown was just talking about Bart W. Stone. How much bravery it took to stand up against the denominational forces. Think seemingly all alone, but not alone, because God was with him. But as many like him and others after him all they wanted to do was to go back to the Bible for their spiritual guidance. And you know what they did when they did what happened when they did this? They found freedom. Freedom that no membership in any denomination give. What is that freedom? Freedom to do what you want to do? No, it's the freedom to do God's will. That's freedom, brother. Freedom to do the will of the Father. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Then said Jesus to those, disciples, to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, or my disciples indeed. And you, ye rather, shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free to do God's will. My topic this afternoon is, is the New Testament church a denomination? No. Okay, we can go home now. No. Is the church a New Testament denomination? Well, what is a denomination? We've already talked that, and I've probably heard better explanations than I could give. But I, I like to think of it as a conversation that I've heard, and you may have heard in the past, between a faithful member of the Lord's church and a sinner, the sinner very kindly says, you know, what denomination do you attend? And the Christian says, you know, I'm not a member of a denomination. I'm a Christian. Well, yeah, I know that. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, but, but, but what church do you attend? Well, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, the church you read out in the Bible. And there the conversation either continues or it is cut off. I one time had that conversation with a barber. <laughs> it's kind of had to... When guys got clippers on your hair, it's kind of hard to argue with them, you know. But, <laughs> but, you know, we ought to turn that question back to the inquirer and say, what's a denomination? A lot of people don't have the foggiest idea what a denomination is. They honestly think it's a, a branch or a sect of this fantasy they have called Christianity. A brethren... A denomination is no more related to Christianity than a buzzard is to an eagle. <laughs> the only thing they can do in common maybe is fly, and not too well. You've seen a buzzard lately. But nominationalists claim that their group is a part of this universal church. And by their own definition, they are not the church, but a fragment of it. One man defined it this way. Denominations are associations of congregations. Though sometimes it might be said that the congregations are localized subdivisions of denominations that have a common heritage. Moreover, a true denomination does not claim to be the only legitimate expression of the church. That sounds like a lot of brethren today. Oh, we're no different than denominations. We're, we have this, as someone mentioned, the Stone Campbell heritage. You know, that's not the church you read about in the New Testament. 
A guy in Woods defined the church in an article I found of his, I believe written in 1960. He said, for definite purposes, we may regard it as the body of Christ whose membership embraces all baptized believers, this definition of the church, who are called out of the world, who acknowledge the Lord as the head thereof, and the Holy Spirit is director and guide. Brethren, we are guided by the Holy Spirit. Yes. When we do what the Bible says, we are guided by the Holy Spirit. And we have been called out of the world to do that. One thing that sets us different in denominations among many, as Brother Bruce pointed out so well, denominations preach and teach the wrong gospel. To begin with, they preach, and this would be a great shock to them, they preach a different Jesus than the New Testament does. You know, on the outskirts of Caesarea Philippi, where there was also, I understand, a temple to Pan, a Greek god, Jesus of Nazareth asked a question of his, of his apostles that has haunted men throughout the ages, still does. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, Matthew 16, verse 13. By their very existence, denomination promotes the idea that Jesus is the author of religious division, confusion, chaos. But men go further. They must go further. They depict Jesus as some social reformer, maybe some community organizer. A superstitious relic that you kind of go to every once in a while. A healer of all physical ailments, even some that you don't have. An emotional crutch. Yet the answer that Simon Peter gave is so clear that it just rings. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, verse 16. That phrase that Peter said, that confession, that declaration, has great power to it. The power comes from that little def definite article, the, which denotes exclusivity. I stayed up all night to get that right. Exclusivity. In essence, what Peter was saying, Lord, you are the one and only Messiah the one and only Son of the one and only living God, and there is no other. N many denominations would not make that absolute statement. I believe back in the 70s, the Disciples of Christ had one of their conventions, and there a motion came up on the floor that simply said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was defeated, because that's too absolute. You can't say that. You might offend someone. By its very nature, the church in the New Testament is not fragmented. While the, the denomination is the child of a religious division. Again, Brother Woods commenting on this difference between denomination and the church. He says the church, regarded in the aggregate, can never embrace less than the whole. A denomination exists for the purpose of designating a limited number. Hence, the church is not a denomination. In other words, Brother Woods, the New Testament church is not a denomination, and a denomination could never be the church. Never. All important to any examination of the gospel of Christ, as I mentioned, denominations do not. They teach a, a false gospel. But any examination of the gospel of Christ, one must examine what must, one must do to be saved. For some denominations, like the Greek Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, Roman Catholic Church, and others, all they require is baptism alone. And I know in the, in, in the Catholic Church now, you can be immersed, you can be sprinkled or you can be poured, whatever you choose. They even have Catholic churches now with baptistries. It's got to be by one of their clergymen. 
Infants are acceptable candidates based on the faith of their parents or godparents. Others, like the Presbyterians, as Brother Ken pointed out, they require confession of faith, followed by sprinkling of water by a member of their clergy. While our Baptist friends, all they require is faith only or faith alone, based on some subjective testimony. Baptism follows salvation according to that false theology. Other denominations, they require a conversion experience. That's all important, that you, you say this quick prayer, and you're saved. The sinner's prayer, where is that sinner's prayer? Still looking for it, hadn't found it yet. It's not there. And it changes, that, even their prayer changes from clergy to clergy. That reminds me years ago, and I believe I've got this nailed down about 1980. Had a hamburger commercial where a senior citizen, after receiving her hamburger, ex exclaimed, where's the beef? Then opened the bun up and said, where's the beef? Well, everybody remembers that. That's a, that's a classic. That's the way it is with denominationalism. Their flawed theology, if you look under it, there's nothing there. There's no biblical authority or very little. You know, at the confession of some creed or confession of faith, somebody needs to holler, where's that in the Bible? At the supposed baptism of an unbeliever, an infant, somebody needs to shout, where's the personal faith? At the sprinkling of a candidate, someone needs to exclaim, where's the burial and resurrection? At the emotion-laden testimony of a religious experience, someone the audience needs to proclaim very clearly, where's the repentance? Followed by, where's the water and the spirit? John 3, verse 5. I wonder what that would happen if somebody did that. Probably shake them all up. Should. Truth is, denominations don't even begin, don't even begin to relate to Jesus Christ's plan of salvation. Think about it. In AD 30, in Jerusalem, on that Sunday morning, at 9 o'clock, by the way, about 9 o'clock, Peter, they would have Peter telling those penitent, probably sobbing Jews, when they asked him, men and brethren, what shall we do? He'd said, you know, it's evident. You're, you're sorry for what you did. Now, as every head is bowed and every eye is shut, say this prayer along with me. It doesn't say that in Acts 2, verse 38 or 37, 38, does it? Later, the denominations would have us having Ananias going to this broken, penitent, praying Saul of Tarsus, Damascus, who hadn't eaten or drunk for three days. And saying to him, saying to Saul, that's all right, Brother Saul, you're saved. Just wait until our next baptismal Sunday. And we'll baptize you into the third Damascus Missionary Immersion Church. <laughs> As I said last night, if the emperor has no clothes, he has no clothes. And you know, denominations, they turn around and they laugh when we, and some of our brethren do too, when we give Christ's plan of salvation, refer to it, they ridicule it, which as we all know or should know, some of you that are listening may not know, that plan of salvation is to hear the gospel, Romans 10, verse 17. To believe that gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, verse 34. To repent, to turn from your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. Confess Jesus as God's, the Christ, the Son of the living God. To be immersed in water for mission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Now, what if someone comes along and says, you know, I've done that. I've done that. But I'm not a member of the, Lord's, of the of Church of Christ. You know, can you be baptized into some man-made body, religious body? Yes, you can. 
Galatians 3, verse 26. For you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you've been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. When I was working in Wyoming, and you find this quite a bit in the western and midwestern states, or quite a bit every once in a while, you run across so-called instrumental Church of Christ. Many of them are very conservative regarding things like modesty and morality. They also claim to baptize for mission of sins. When this guitar is strumming in the background, melodiously, maybe they're singing Kumbaya, I don't know. But what is one being baptized into? At the very least, you're being baptized into a body that's practicing unauthorized worship. Colossians 3, verse 16, 17. Not into the body of Christ. But you know, for some brethren, that's their litmus test. Oh, they baptize for remission of sins. We've got to embrace them. Give them a holy kiss or whatever it takes. Because they baptize for remission of sins. Well, you know, if we use that litmus test, what about the Mormons? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I say that all right? Okay. The Mormons, what about them? They baptize for remission of sins. Brother Ken, what about the Seventh-day Adventists? They baptize for mission sins. And other groups that all claim they baptize for the mission of sin. Well, as you used to say, brethren, forever, if there was an error that was produced tonight, religious error, you could go to your New Testament and find it, how to refute it, because the New Testament is inspired. And all you've got to go to is John, Acts chapter 19. There were the Apostle Paul found some the disciples of John, baptized disciples of John to Ephesus, who'd been baptized by John, either by John himself, probably some think Apollos, for the remission of sins. John did that, Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Now, by inspiration, Luke and the Holy Spirit records this because it shows us the apostle Paul didn't recognize that baptism. Oh, how dare you do that, Paul? He did it. Because these disciples had not been baptized to Christ. They were not members of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. And neither are some folks today, religious folks, pious folks, that claim they have been baptized also. But another great difference between us and denominations, why we're not a denomination, denominations are man-made organizations, not the church that Jesus died for. You know, the churches that Jesus built is a spiritual entity. As Jesus says, it dwells within you. The spirit is a spiritual thing, not a, a physical structure complete with a bureaucracy. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Acts 17, verse 24, that I think was one of the most bravest statements in the New Testament. Apostle Paul, in the midst of all these educated pagans, said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Yet denominationalism emphasizes what? The material. They emphasize their temples, their buildings, their headquarters, their clergy, their ceremonies, their activities, everything. What is it? What was Wednesday? Ash? We, Wednesday and Lent, where do you find that in the New Testament? They had to, I heard TV this morning, or yesterday had to dig up, find the book of Jeremiah to find something about dust or something to say that was, or ashes had to do with Ash Wednesday. But these bureaucracies have this, they've got to maintain this, as I mentioned, this ecclesiastical structure with layer upon layer upon layer of bureaucracy. Well, where do you go? The New Testament is... As the brother just pointed out, do you find that? No, you don't find that bureaucracy. What do you find? Jesus Christ, the head, the king of the church. You find elders, servants of the king, overseers of the local congregation. You find deacons, servants of the church under the authority of the elders. There's no hint of some grand ecclesiastical bureaucracy. There's no archbishops, metropolitans, Apostles, modern day apostles, superintendents, messengers, cardinals, primates, elderesses, or deaconesses, and you could go on and on. You don't find any of that. But you, you do find something that you find in big government. 
you do find something that you find in big corporations, you find bureaucracy. And you know, they have to have that. Because if you want to run a smooth, man-made organization, you've got to have all that staff and layer upon layer of bureaucracy. Well, where's, as one brother said earlier, where's the command? Where's the necessary inference? Where's the proved example in the Bible, the Holy Bible, for such organizational structure? The Bible is silent as a tomb, prohibitively silent. Luke and the Holy Spirit recorded the, for example, the concluding efforts of Paul and Barnabas in their missionary journey when he wrote, And when they are ordained elders in every church and had prayed and fasted, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed, Acts chapter 11, verse 29 and 30. Now this would have been a perfect time, a perfect time for Paul and Barnabas to lay hands on the hierarchy, to not only appoint elders and but to appoint the head elder head bishop in every congregation then an archbishop over the group of head bishops but you know what that would have been man's way not Christ's way Christ's way is what the Holy Spirit recorded for us in Acts 11 denominational hierarchy was the result of that great apostasy that began and I have in my notes the second century AD I'd rather say the latter part of the first century and into the second century. It records that when Paul warned the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 about that. And you know what all that is and what it remains? It remains a power grab. That's what it is. That's what all these denominational organizations are. That's what it was back then. That's what that apostasy produced, a power grab, where it's the only way for ambitious men to set aside the Bible the authority in the pattern in the Bible and get what they want, power. Matthew 20, the Lord said, Ye know the prince of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority unto, upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Whosoever be chief among you, let him be your minister. Matthew 20, verse 25 through 27. Brother F.W. Maddox, in his book, The Eternal Kingdom, wrote these words, talking about these departures from the faith. He said, we are on safe ground when we say that any change in doctrinal organization from that found in the New Testament is a departure. This is the only test needed. Any claim to undenominationalism rests solely upon this principle. If the church, under the apostolic guidance, taught or practiced a certain thing, the adherence to this preaching, teaching, or practice today cannot be said to be denominational. And any departure from some teaching or practice, however, is denominational and cannot be characteristic of the eternal kingdom. In order to remain undenominational, we must adhere to the New Testament pattern. A study of how departures came about and, this, and the forms that they took will be very helpful in safeguarding the church today. Amen. That was written back in the 60s, I think. But you know, as I read that the other day, didn't include this in my manuscript, doesn't this describe elder reaffirmation, reevaluation, reformation, what it could lead to? It's a departure from the pattern of the New Testament. It could lead to denomination. That's why, one reason why it's wrong. But denominations also have a different origin than the Church of Christ. And brother, the brother pointed that out in his chart. The origin of the Church of Christ is older than any denomination. It originated in the mind of God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It was established on the, this earth on the day of Pentecost, 30 A.D., in Jerusalem, as foretold by the Old Testament prophets, and by Jesus himself in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 49. At that time, the preaching of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the seed of the kingdom, produced the child of God by the new birth. On that glorious day, for the first time, God added new citizens to the kingdom. They weren't Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, or whatever. They were Christians. When that first penitent sinner was lifted out of that watery baptismal water that day, 
he or she was no longer a sinner, but a saint. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21. They were not added to a denomination since there weren't any. God added them to his family, the church of Christ. So what did they do? They bore the family name. What was that name? Christian. The name of their spiritual husband, Jesus Christ. They, weren't, they didn't come out of that water a hyphenated Christian, a evangelical Christian, or a fundamentalist Christian, or a mainline Christian, or a born-again Christian, or a conservative Christian, or a liberal Christian. You know what that would have made if that had been possible? That would have made Jesus Christ a, a spiritual polygamist. If that had happened. Some denominations say, like the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic said, Oh, we're old. We go back to the beginning. But they're not as old church Christ. They are children of that great apostasy that I talked about, the end of the first century, the beginning and into the second century, which the prophet Paul foretold. And other denominations that came along sprang from their loins at a later date. Many others were born from religious division, man made religious doctrines, traditions, supposed revelations from God like the Mormons. None of those came about because of the seed of the kingdom or the word of God. None of these human organizations, the Church of Christ, the church you read about in the Bible. One of the great illustrations gospel preachers have used for a long, long time concerning denominations is the, and some have already talked about this, is about the seed and its fruit. In the natural world, as we mentioned, you take one type of seed and it doesn't produce another type of plant. A watermelon seed doesn't produce a pear tree. This is what's called, some have called the law of kind that God introduced in creation. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, excuse me, and the fruit of the tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is of itself upon the earth, and it was so, Genesis 1 verse 11. That same law applies to Christians, the seed of the kingdom. Since that great, since that great apostasy that I spoke of, the doctrines of men have produced not Christians, but duped sinners. These poor souls have never left Satan's kingdom. Denomination cannot produce a Christian since it came from the wrong seed. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of, of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Luke 6, verse 43 and 44. But you know, men and some of our own brethren still put their hands searching around that thorn bush and what they come up with? A bunch of, bunch of puncture wounds. As the late brother Thomas Warren used to say, or wrote, wrote title of his, one of his books, the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. But you know, another great point at why we are a non-denomination is that the denomination is larger than the local church of Christ. One argument, that the, uh, one argument against the central control displayed by denominations in general is the attitude that you find of the first century church of Christ in Jerusalem. This is a wonderful thing. You know, in the first century, this congregation in Jerusalem could have claimed authority over all of the congregations, according to the world, because they were the first established church, they, the congregation. They were the, quote, mother church. And, but you don't find that denominational attitude among them. They didn't do that. For example, that great example in the Bible in Acts chapter 15, where Paul and the Antiochian brethren go down to Jerusalem, or is it, or is it up to Jerusalem? Whatever. They go up to, they go up to Jerusalem and to confront the brethren there because of the Judaizers in their ranks. And they, the elders and the apostles at Jerusalem, they did not do what many brethren do today when one of their members is uh, caught up in some apostasy. They didn't circle the wagons and say, oh, they're one of us. Oh, they may be, they may be Judaizers, but they're our Judaizers. <laughs> what does it say? Acts 15, verse 16, verse 6 rather. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider the matter. Now you read carefully in there, and there was a lot of heated discussion. There was a lot of examination of the scriptures. They issued a letter 
denouncing the Judaizers, encouraging the Gentiles the godliness. And what came out of that? Congregational autonomy and faithfulness to that pattern was upheld. And you know, exact opposite occurs today because a denomination is larger than local church. It has no scriptural authority for its existence. For example, there's a great controversy among many denominations today over the ordination of women and ordination of homosexuals, unrepentant homosexuals. Both issues are anathema to the word of God, but where did that ever stop a denomination from doing anything? For years, proponents of these issues have lobbied their, their conventions, their assemblies, and to accept these abominations. And they cajole, and they harangue, and they arm twist, and finally, the word of God is violated again. They vote on it. You don't see that in Jerusalem. This wasn't any church council in Acts 15. There was no politicking, no solemn assembly of the delegates with their red hats on or whatever color it is. No vote was taken because God had already decreed the outcome. A denomination or a missionary society or a parachurch organization like the Church of Christ's National Relief overreaches by its very existence, it sins by preempting the authority God gave to the local congregation of the Church of Christ alone. That glory takes away that glory. The denomination is also smaller than the Church of Christ. Brethren, the little congregation, little congregation, it's maybe a little to you, that I preach for, they are the Church of Christ. Just as much as you all are here today at spring. Denomination, not that way. Also denominations, it's been mentioned already, their names. They have all these names. We could go on about that. Recently, the Southern Baptist Convention had a quite a tussle about changing their name. And the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Brian Wright, explained it this way. He said, part of this, they did a study. Part of the study is consider a name change as possibility of removing a barrier to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound like some of our brethren? There are so many people that are unreached that if it's a barrier to have communion with them or for them to con even consider coming to a, a new church plant that is a Southern Baptist church. How contradictory that is to the mind that wants to do the will of God above all. Because God's already given us a name. It's called Christian. We're called collectively after our King, the Church of Christ. No scripture authority. I think they've They've come up with this idea, and now they're going to call themselves the Great Commission Church. When did the Baptist Church ever follow the Great Commission? <laughs> Brethren, this all comes down to the, the core sin, I think, of denominationalism, and that is rebellious pride. Notice what Paul said, and then I'll close. Now these things, brethren, have I in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that ye, that in us ye might learn not to go beyond the things that are written, that no one be puffed up for the one against the other. Isn't that what denominationalism is? Oh, I'm, oh we're all part of the body of Christ, but I'm going a little bit better way than you're going. My method is a little better, better than yours. Brethren, the Church of Christ is, a is not a denomination and never has been because denominations, as Brother Douglas pointed out, violate the will of God and the Father. We'd be one, Acts chapter, I mean John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. And however sweet-smelling and sweet-sounding they, they are, they are the devil's pawn and not the church that Jesus died for. There may be someone here tonight wants to obey that gospel plan of salvation I mentioned earlier, wants to put a Lord on in baptism and rise up in that watery grave no longer or not ever a member of denomination, a member of the church that Jesus died for. Or maybe tonight there's someone that's a member of that church and you need to confess your sins and ask your brethren as well as the Lord forgiveness. If this need tonight, please come as we stand and sing.